Welcome back to Christian's Colloquy. I'm Christian, and I'm so glad that you could join me again this week. Before diving into today's topic, I should first acknowledge that this is very interesting timing. This show was planned many months ago, talking about Lemuel Haynes, and it just so happens now that this show sort of takes on an extra dimension. For those who don't know, Lemuel Haynes is well remembered as the Black Puritan, or the first black pastor ordained in America. And for those who are perhaps watching in the future, right now in North America, there is a renewed discussion about race, racism, and racial reconciliation. Again, this wasn't planned. I didn't mean to talk, speak about Lemuel Haynes at the same time as uh, all this discussion about race and racism, but perhaps this is a happy coincidence. And of course, I'm a firm believer in the providence of God, so perhaps that's what's going on here, and we're getting a, a special look at how God's providence works out in these ways. With all that said, let me just dive in and say Lemuel Haynes is a very cool character from church history. As I've said throughout my episodes, especially when speaking about women, it's so great and so important to acknowledge these often neglected voices in church history. A lot of women and people of color, to use the politically correct phrase, are often forgotten, and that is for a myriad of reasons. One of those reasons being that in history, those voices were often hard to hear, hard to record, that there is the unfortunate reality that theology in the Western church was often the domain of white men. For those of you who don't know me, I should say that I'm not uh, particularly woke on these issues, but I still think that's an important thing to acknowledge, that black voices, female voices, Chinese voices, a lot of these voices, no matter where they are in the world, that without having the status of a white man in a particular social class, your voice was almost always forgotten. So, it's cool to be able to have a lot of writings of Lemuel Haynes and to know a lot about his life. So, that's what I'm going to share today. I want to share with you who Lemuel Haynes was, why he was important, and what sort of legacy he left. And as we unpack that legacy, we're going to take a look at one of his sermons and really come away with how his spirituality, his piety, what he believed, formulates the answers to some of the big questions we're facing right now in our society. I think it's going to be a great show. I think it's going to be a great episode. I hope that you're interested. This is a super timely topic. And right now, I just want to dive in and start telling you about who Lemuel Haynes was, where he came from, and what he was about. So, here are the facts. Lemuel Haynes was born July 1st in 1753 in West Hartford, Connecticut. While still an infant, Haynes was placed in indentured servitude to David Rose, a deacon in Granville, Massachusetts. In case you don't know, or in case you weren't aware, it is something we don't talk about a lot today. Indentured, servitu indentured servants were indiv individuals who bargained away their labor for a period of four to seven years in exchange for passage to the New World. That's from the Oxford Bibliographies. Indentured servitude isn't something we speak a lot about today. It's often neglected uh, so that we could talk about the perhaps more important or more devastating reality of slavery. But for a long time in American history, in British America, indentured servitude was a common reality. People would trade away their freedom for a set period of time to work on a farm, to work on a business. And while they weren't quite slaves, the conditions were often very hard. And that's where Lemuel Hayes' story begins. He's traded away or given away at a young age to indentured servitude. Returning to the facts, we'll talk about why that is. Haynes never knew his parents, but what we do know is that his mother was white and his father was black. Haynes was a mixed individual, much like myself. And given that dynamic, especially in that period, there are a lot of questions left for historians today exactly what was going on with his parents, who, who they were, how they came together? Was their relationship consensual? I don't have those answers. The biographies I checked out, they didn't have those answers. But 
That sets the stage for why Haynes was left in this precarious situation and why eventually the guardian he did have put him into indentured servitude at a very young age. At about five months, he was given to the Rose family. While with Deacon Rose and his family, Haynes was well provided for. While he was in that indentured servitude relationship, the Rose family took, care for, uh, took great care of him. Like many other children, he attended a local school, and Haynes was taught in the home by the Roses. With the Roses, he faithfully attended the local Congregationalist Church, and he was brought up diligently in the Christian faith. Daily prayers, Sabbath observance on Sunday, of course, and all the other marks of Christian family were provided to Haynes. As he grew up in his indentured servitude, Haynes became a trusted member of the family's farming business. The, the father, Deacon Rose, would give Haynes a lot of responsibilities. He would be a part of the family in a way. Very, very fortunate for Haynes. In 1774, at age 21, Haynes's period of indentured ser servitude was completed. And from there, he joined the Minutemen. According to the Oxford Reference, a page online, the American Revolutionary Minutemen were those who were ready at a minute's notice to take up arms in defense of their property or country. For a bit of context, it's important to note right now that this period in the middle of the 1770s was the major time of the American Revolution. That moment in history when the 13 colonies, the American colonies, what would become America, revolted against the British Empire, the British King. And for those of you who know, we, we are aware of the discussion about taxation, about representation, about the billeting of soldiers and all those types of things. But for our story, it's important to know note that Haynes from 1774 onward was deeply committed to the American cause. He fell right in with the spirit of the age and joined up with the Minutemen, joined up with the Continental Army, and was a firm supporter of American freedom, but also American Republican values. He totally was on board with the American ideas, totally on board with the American experiment, and wanted to defend it against the British king and his armies. Returning to Haynes's story, his biographical sketch, the facts, we have to note that in 1776, that famous year, he was actually forced to leave the Continental Army. Not due to being dishonorably discharged or anything like that, but in that year he actually contracted a disease, typhus, and was forced to leave due to his health. Upon leaving the Continental Army, uh, Haynes returned to the home of Deacon Rose. And it was while he returned to the home of Deacon Rose in that following period that his talent for preaching was discovered. In the Rose home, they had a family tradition. In the evenings, certain evenings, they would read out the sermons. The Roses, who were, of course, uh, these Congregationalists, were those Congregationalists who embraced the revival. So when they read sermons, they were reading the works of figures like Jonathan Edwards and George Whitfield, among others, who had these great revivalistic sermons. It was during one of those nights that it was Lemuel's turn to read a sermon. So he got up, he read the sermon, and... Deacon Rose was shocked. It was an amazing sermon. So Rose asked Haynes, Oh, who was that sermon by? Was that a sermon of Edwards? Haynes replies, No, it wasn't. Rose then says, Well, was that a sermon of Whitfield? That, that was an excellent sermon. It had to be Whitfield then. Haynes replies, No, it wasn't him either. In the end, it turns out that that sermon was actually Haynes' own composition. He wrote this sermon himself. This sermon that Deacon Rose, an influential churchman, a well-regarded Christian, thought was the work of Edwards or Whitfield, was actually the work of the young Lemuel Haynes. Amazing. From there, after having this preaching talent identified, Haynes would begin his training for ministry. And... During that time, while training under several pastors, Haynes embraced a theological school called the New Divinity. Basically, like Isaac Bacchus, a figure we covered in an earlier episode on this uh, channel, 
Haynes embraced the evangelical Calvinism of Jonathan Edwards. He embraced this particular stream of reformed Calvinistic thought that was championed by evangelicals like Edwards. Going on from there, in 1780, after completing his theological education, Haynes would become the first African American ordained by an American denomination. This was a big deal. As most of you are aware, 1780, African Americans were still in the midst of dealing with widespread slavery throughout the land. While there were, of course, freemen, it was a, not a good time to be an African American, and it certainly would have been rare for an African American to have the education and, as Haynes was first called, to be a pastor. That was incredibly rare, and I'm sure we can only imagine the type of opposition, the type of questions and looks that he received after that moment. Moving on in the biographical sketch, though. Initially, Haynes served as a supply pastor in his congregational church in Granville. But from there, he took up a pastoral call in Connecticut in another town called Torrington. And eventually, Haynes actually ended up in Rutland, Vermont. And while in Rutland, he was pastoring an all-white congregation. Just imagine that. The first African-American pastor in American history was serving at an all-white congregation. Already in 2020, most of us would struggle to imagine that site in our day and age. That, that would seem to be a rare sight. A pastor, a black pastor, serving and ministering over an all-white congregation. But here Haynes was doing that in the late 18th century. Amazing. Mind-blowing, one might say. Haynes served in Rutland in this all-white church for 30 years. And not only was he an amazing pastor to that congregation, it was during that time that Haynes also became known as a popular defender of Christian orthodoxy. You could often find him writing works against Arminianism, against Universalism, but also against Deism. Deism being one of those schools of thought that was very much around in the American political world at that time. I'm sure some of you are aware of some of those questions and issues among the founding fathers of America. Haynes would publish many theological works. These works range from his very pastoral sermons, but also to the apologetic works, the works defending the Christian faith that he produced as a public figure. But that's not all he wrote. Haynes would also have works against the institution of slavery. He would also write uh, books and tracts defending the principles of American republicanism. One of his works that encompassed actually both of those topics, it was a work that actually opposed slavery, wrote against slavery, while promoting American republican values, was a work entitled The Nature and Importance of True Republicanism. I haven't read it myself yet, but I look forward to reading it soon. After his 30-year post in Rutland, Haynes would serve in two more churches, one again in Vermont, but another in New York. Finally, in 1833, at age 80, Haynes would die, and upon his death, he would leave an incredible legacy of both Christian faithfulness and evangelical piety. Haynes was certainly an amazing figure first black pastor in America, and he pastored until the very end. What an amazing testimony, what an amazing life. To dig in, though, on this evangelical piety I mentioned, I think it's worth now unpacking some of his works, unpacking a passages from one of his sermons to really capture that. And which sermon do you think I'm going to talk about? It's none other than that first sermon that he delivered. That first sermon that he gave at the home of Deacon Rose, where Deacon Rose thought it was either Edwards or Whitfield. That sermon was preached on the topic of regeneration, the doctrine of the new birth. That doctrine being based on the text that Lemuel Haynes preached from. Let me read that out for you. That text was John 3.3. 3 where Jesus gives his famous words, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. 
in this sermon, Haynes would unpack the one of the most treasured, one of the most promoted doctrine of the 18th and 19th century evangelicals. That doctrine of regeneration, the new birth, the understanding that we must be born again. Everyone in the world who is to be saved must be born again. They must be spiritually reborn. They must be brought from spiritual death to spiritual life by the work of God through the Holy Spirit. Haynes really unpacks this doctrine in this sermon. And instead of just giving uh, a teaching on what it means, he actually unpacks its necessity and its nature. The necessity of regeneration and the nature of regeneration. And as he does that, Haynes not only talks about the necessity and nature, he also describes the fruit of regeneration. When a person is in spiritual death, the Holy Spirit works inside of them, brings them to life. But what flows out of that new life? What does it mean? What does it result in when a person is born again? For Haynes, he brings up four points. And to summarize those four points in my own words, he first says that fr the fruit of regeneration is love. From there, he talks about the fruit of regeneration being repentance. The third one he describes is belief. Finally, the fourth one he describes is obedience. What are the fruit of regeneration? It is to love. It is to repent of your sin. It is to believe in Jesus Christ. And finally, it is to obey the word of God. It's an amazing thing. So from there, I want to now briefly unpack one of those points. I'll read a section from Haynes, but I want to unpack one of those fruits of regeneration. That fruit being the fruit of love. Let me read to you a passage from Haynes where he describes the fruit of regeneration that is love. Haynes write this. Those who are regenerate, starting in my own words, Haynes then says, he loves God supremely. He loves holiness for what it is in itself, because it agrees with his new temper. He chooses and prefers that to anything else. He loves the law of God. He loves the gospel and everything that is godlike. He loves the holy angels and the spirits of just men made perfect. His affections are set on things that are above. His treasure is there, and his heart will be there also. He loves the people of God in this world. Nay, wherever moral resuscitude is to be seen, he falls in love with it. He loves all mankind with a holy and virtuous love. Although he cannot love those that are enemies of God with a love of complacency, yet he loves them with the love of benevolence. He is of a noble and generous spirit. He is a well-wisher to all mankind. And this supreme love to God and benevolence to man is spoken of in scripture as the very essence of true religion. Just from that one point within that one fruit flowing out of this one doctrine, there can be so much to unpack. We, we could spend all day talking about what Haynes has just said about love. But for the sake of the show today and for the sake of your time, respecting your time, I want to just leave you with two conclusions and one question. Two conclusions and one question about the love which flows out of a Christian's regeneration. That first conclusion is to recognize that Christians are called to be a people of love. We are called to love because we are told that our God is love. We must love because we are told our God is love. Take that in. Take that in. Our God is love, so Christians must love. Further, we are told that our love is only possible because God first loved us. We may love because God first loved us. The Christian life begins and ends with love. One cannot conceive of Christianity without love. But 
we must remember that our love as Christians is defined by God's love. We must love what he loves. We must seek to love how he loves. And we must understand that genuine love flows out of his love and our love for God. That's a big deal. Love and Christianity cannot be separated. That's where I believe the Apostle Paul is coming from when he makes that famous statement in 1 Corinthians. Let me read that for you. So now, faith, hope, and love abide. These three. But the greatest of these is love. What's the first point that we can conclude from Haynes? What's that first conclusion we have? Christianity cannot be separated from love. That's a big deal. Moving on from there, the other conclusion I want to draw out from Haynes's little excerpt is that Christian love, the love which flows out of re- regeneration, goes beyond the usual suspects. Often when Christians speak of their love, they speak in two different ways. First of all, we speak of our love for God. That is primary, that is fundamental, that is so essential. But I think Christians, if you're a Christian watching this, you're already sold on that. The second element of Christian love we speak of is our love for humanity. Oh, we love everybody. Christians love everyone. And that's something we often say as a platitude, but I think Haynes draws us further. He draws us further than the love of God and a general love of humanity. The first way he draws us further was from that quote in the middle of that passage. He describes how our love, the Christian's love, goes beyond God and people. Christians, those who are regenerate, will actually love the law of God. They will love the gospel. And they will love all God-like things. Take that in for a moment. The love which flows out of regeneration is a love of the law of God. Of course, we love the gospel. I think we got that. The gospel is the the story. It's the events in history by which we are saved, looking and trusting in the life and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. But the regenerate person, according to Haynes, loves the law of God. They love the rules and ordinances of God. That might seem to some of you to be a strange thing to love. But I would suggest that Haynes is being 100% biblical when he says that. Think about Psalm 119. That very famous psalm, maybe famous because it's the longest psalm in the Bible, in the book of Psalms. But it has many profound statements about how God's people should relate to his law. Listen to one verse from this psalm. Psalm 119 verse 97 says, Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. I believe this is a call to not only love the law, but as we saw in the second half of that verse, to meditate it, to meditate upon it day and night. Christians love the law, love the law of God, because we recognize that it is good. Not, it's not just a bunch of rules, but it is the best way for us to live. It's the way that God intends us to live. That's one of those interesting things that uh, I think we, we have a response to non-Christians who often reply that Christianity is just a bunch of rules. I think Christians should reply with a bit of, maybe a bit of cheek saying, Christianity is a bunch of rules, but not just a bunch of rules. Christianity has many rules. We have the law of God, which tells us what to do and what not to do. But that law, that telling us of what to do and what not to do, is one of the greatest gifts that God can give us. We are not only told to live holy, but we are told how to live holy. God doesn't just give us commands and leave us in the dark. He tells us how to walk. He lays out a path before us. And his law, as we're told in that same psalm, is a light for our feet. It is a guide for our path. It is amazing. And I believe that it is this point of Christian love that flows into all other elements of Christian regeneration. It is because of Christian love that we repent of our sin. Because we love God, we love his law, we love other people, we turn away from our sin. It is because of the law of God, because of the gospel, because of God himself and love of other people that we 
believe in Jesus Christ. And finally, and perhaps most obviously, it's because of the love of the law of God, because of our love of God, that we obey the word of God. We see it as good, recognize it as good, and pursue after it. That is all amazing. But it's from there, I think that we can understand that Christian love also must be specific. Turning to that point of Christian's, a Christian's love for humanity, Lemuel Haynes points out how this Christian love of mankind, of humanity, should be specific. As he said, we should be well-wishers upon all mankind, upon every human being. We should seek and pursue their best because we love them out of benevolence. I believe that's exactly what Jesus is teaching in the Sermon on the Mount when he says this, But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Jesus recognizes that people are going to be hard to love, yet he commands us to love them all the same. And not just in a general sense, but in a specific sense. Love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. That's the call. And that's the type of love which flows out of regeneration. That's the type of love which flows out of our new birth as Christians. So what are the conclusions from Haynes? First of all, Christianity can't be separated from love. Our God is love and we are able to love and call to love because of him. Secondly, our love goes beyond the usual suspects. Not only are we called to love God's people and called to love God, We are called to love the things of God, his law, his gospel, and we're told to love humanity in a specific sense, not just a general platitude of loving everyone, but loving everyone in a specific sense, our enemies and those who persecute us. From there, I believe we're left with one question, and that's a question I want to leave with you. You, Christian, today, right now, are you known by your love? Are you known by the love which flows out of regeneration? Do you have this love? Do you live in light of this love? Does this love define your thoughts, your words, and your deeds? That's a massive question, and I'm going to leave that for you to dwell on, to think about, and to hopefully be encouraged by. If this were a normal show during a normal time, I would now be entering into my conclusion. But as you know, and as I talked about at the start of this show, we live right now in interesting times, and I would be remiss to pass up this opportunity to build off of Lemuel Haynes' testimony, life, and teaching to not address address issues today. So before we close... I want to just say that Lemuel Haynes is exactly why we study church history. Right now in 2020, we in North America are facing dramatic, profound, new questions about race, racism, and racial reconciliation. And one thing I think Christians need to be ready and prepared to do is to realize that while these questions are new in a sense, they're also very old in a sense. These are not the first time we're encountering questions about race, racism, and racial reconciliation. Lemuel Haynes, just as a recap, was a black man in America in the 1700s, during the time when slavery was rife. And not only was he a black man in America during that time, he was a black pastor in a white congregation. That is a testimony I think we would be foolish to pass on learning from. That should be one of the first places we go to get some more information. We go to scripture, and then we go to the diligent witness of Christians in the past. And I believe that when we go to the the testimony of Lemuel Haynes, what is his solution? It's to point us right back to scripture. It's to point us right back to God's word. If we are to approach this situation today, and when we're thinking about race and racial reconciliation, I think that we as evangelicals, we as Christians, those of you who are Christians watching this, especially evangelicals, we need to embrace the same realities that Lemuel Haynes embraced and taught on. And those realities are the spiritual realities. 
We just spoke about regeneration. We just spoke about the new birth. But if you read Lemuel Haynes' full sermon, and as he discusses the necessity of regeneration, I think we can understand that how regeneration is the solution to a fundamental problem. When we're thinking about the racial drama in America and North America today, I think we need to recognize the following fact. The underlying problem in American society is not racial tension. The underlying problem in the black community today is not the absence of father figures, it's not police brutality, it's not systemic discrimination, it's something much deeper and much more sinister than that. The underlying problem for the black community, for the American nation, for the North American greater, greater identity, whatever it is, is sin and rebellion. That is the problem, that is the underlying issue all humanity is facing. And what is the solution to that? It's not an agenda of social justice. It is not an agenda of racial reconciliation. It is the truth. It is the understanding that we must be born again. We must be regenerated. What we have now in society is the result of much of society being dead in their sins. It is the result of those even being alive in Christ, not living in line with the love, with the truth that the regeneration should lead to. What we have in our world today is a spiritual problem which requires a spiritual solution. The problem is sin, and the only solution is Jesus Christ. And not Jesus Christ in some abstract, in some abstract sense. As Lemuel Haynes would support and certainly preach, the answer of Jesus Christ is the one that took place in an event 2,000 years ago. To find our solution for today's problems, we must have a mindset that is rooted in the past. We must look to what Jesus Christ did, why he came, and what he accomplished. That's a big message, that's a broad message, but I think if we were to embrace the mentality and the teaching of men such as Lemuel Haynes, we would be much better equipped to have the dialogues, to have the discussions, and to face the issues that we need to face today. That's a brief encouragement, but I think it is one that is hopeful. Why is it hopeful? Because while we know Jesus accomplished a great victory 2,000 years ago, we know that he will return. The one who rose again will descend. And when he descends, he will bring perfect peace. So I encourage you, as I reflect on the ministry of Lemuel Haynes, let's embrace a gospel-mindedness. Let's recognize that the word of God is sufficient. Let re let's recognize that the underlying problem is sin and that the solution we need can only come from the work of God. That's my encouragement, and I hope that it is encouraging, and I hope that it stimulates some discussion. If you enjoyed today's show, please leave a like. That greatly helps the channel. And if you can, and if you're willing, and if you're able, leave a comment in the chat. Let me know what you're thinking. If you have some questions, maybe you want to learn more, I'll put some resources down below. But if you have a question, a comment, some, comment, some feedback, let me know. I would love to hear from you. I would love for this to be a dialogue. That's all I have for today. I hope you enjoyed. I'll see you again here next Monday on Christian's Colloquy. Take care.